from the Catholic underground. Today on the show, R.I.P. Flappy Bird, Parenting the New Millennials Digital Magazines, our picks of the week and so much more, the Catholic Underground starts right now. Yes, my friends, it is time for the Catholic Underground, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 257. I am Father Chris Decker, and if you are listening live, you can join us at catholicunderground.tv and get your chat on. A special welcome to those of you who are watching us on YouTube Live and our CUTV live stream. Joining me this week, we've got Father Ryan Humphreys. He is the rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana. Ask him about his Mosetta. Hello, Father. Hello, world. Also, we've got Kathleen Lee. She is a teacher at St. Joe's Academy in Baton Rouge. She is our semi-pro faith ninja, and she's got post-it notes. Hey, Kathleen. Hey, how are you? I am well, and I thank you. Jeff Blackwell is the technical director of the CU. He also operates uh, a really nice little pizza cart outside the radio station. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Father. Good to be here. Yes, indeed. And Mary-Kate Taylor is our video director for the live stream. She is unseen, but she is seen in the hearts of all. And, of course, um... I haven't played this game before. In fact, I, I missed my shot. But one of um, the only four people who haven't. I must have been one of the only four people. Make it five. <laughs> yeah, Flappy Bird. Kathleen, did you download Flappy Bird? I did not. I never did. <gasps> really? So wow. So I, I Mary Kate, did you? Mary Kate didn't download it either. So one, well, two, good three, Lord. four, five. Ah. So so five out of six undergrounders have no idea what we're about to talk about. Uh, so I do know this, Father. It was it was a game, and it was poised to become the most popular game ever. It, it was way up there. Um, if, if you remember, you know, these, these iOS games kind of happen in waves, right? The yeah. first one that took off was Angry Birds, you know, and everybody wanted to play Angry Birds. And, and then after a while, we figured out how to play Angry Birds, and it kind of got less exciting, and it peaked, and it receded to an above-average usership, but it, it's receded. Then there was Fruit Ninja, which was all kinds of awesome. Mm-hmm. And then after Fruit Ninja dot went the way of the dodo, we had Doodle Jump. I think everybody in the world played Doodle Jump. I did not. And then, good Lord, man. No. <laughs> What's wrong with you people? I don't, I don't well, know. Well, anyway, after Doodle Jump uh, went the way of the dodo, um, we got Flappy Bird, which looked like, uh, I don't even know what it looked like. It looked like it was set in Super Mario Brothers. Yeah. Um, with all these kind of weird pipe things. And uh, and it was basically you just keep tapping the screen. And when you tap the screen, the little bird flaps and it goes up a little bit. Oh. And it goes faster and faster and faster across the screen. And you're trying to get between these pipes. And it Supposedly, is, it was really hard. Well, it was, it was easy to play, but extremely hard to get good at. And so your high score would be five. Uh. <laughs> you know, and so people would play this thing for an hour and never get above like level five. You know, uh-huh. I had one kid in my uh, my school who was like level thirteen, and he was you know basically a rock god. Uh-huh. You know, walking around like I've got Flappy Bird number thirteen. You know, <laughs> um, but uh, but the creator of the game uh, uh, is a Vietnamese guy, uh, coder named uh, Dung Nguyen, mm-hmm. who uh, ha- who's made dozens of these little games. He's just time killers. You know, this is yeah. you're standing in the grocery store, you're waiting in line, and you just pull out your iPhone, and you play this little game. But he says, quote. Flappy Birds was designed to play in a few minutes when you're relaxed, Mm -hmm. but it happened to become an addictive product. I think that it has become a problem, and to solve that problem, it's best to take Flappy Bird down. It's gone forever. So it went the way of the Willy Wonka factory. It just shut down one day. It did. I mean, and and Mm -hmm. this guy, this guy is kind of my hero because he looks around and sees this is not good for society. And just says, well, I've made a decision. It's over. And pulls the number one game on iTunes store. Just pulls it. Done. And, over. And I was going to say, here's the, the insanely weird thing. Is this guy was making bank on this game, too. Oh. 50 grand a day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's really saying something. Um, he's making 50 grand a day. So either he doesn't need the money or his virtue or, and the virtue of everybody else is worth more than the money. Um, I don't know, Kathleen. W- if you were making fifty grand a day on a game, yeah. but you couldn't take the hate mail because supposedly that was part of it, right? Is people were writing in telling him how hard the game was, and and he he realized what a what a big kind of albatross he's created yeah. in the shopping line. I would like to think that I would I would do the same thing, take it down. 
because there are a lot of, I mean, you know, watching my students, they can just, uh, that's why my class takes their notes on uh, paper. Oh. Old fashioned. Are you one of the only teachers that does that? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, Kathleen is old quite, school. I haven't quite been discovered yet, but. Oh. oh. But yeah, because you look out and it's like, uh, I'm like, hello. Mm -hmm. I know that you are not even paying attention to what I am talking to you about. Yeah. I'm talking about incorruptibles, people, and they are like. <laughs> uh. So yeah, I, I I would like to say with my experience with with youth that I would, I would shut it down. I don't know, Jeff. Fifty thousand bucks a day. What about you? Uh, if I was making fifty thousand dollars a day, I'd take next week off. So, <laughs> so, uh, but one of the things that I had read about this is that it looked very similar to is it a Mario Brothers game, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, that uh, perhaps the the real underlying reason for him uh, pulling the plug on this uh, is because that there was a possible litigation in the works, but. Um, that has not been verified, but uh, you uh, know, still to give up that kind of jack, ooh, man, I don't know. I I would like to think that that this is a this is not just an act of um, you know of of not needing the money, but perhaps this is a man of virtue, right? Saying, well, hey, it became an addictive product. It's a problem. It's gone. That to me of uh, of of the Vietnamese folks that I know, and uh, Father, you and I have known many throughout our seminary days. There, there is such um, a desire to do what is right by the guys yeah. that we know um, that, that I wouldn't put this past a, a very um, strict code of ethics. That, that Yeah, th and that's true, and yeah. I kind of feel like the same thing. I feel like this guy really does, you know, want what's best for people. And frankly, I mean, you know, he's been running this game for several months, and if he's been making that kind of scratch every day, you know, he's probably going to be fairly set up. He's in vietnam which has a fairly low uh cost of living you know compared to the united states and so this guy's probably you know got enough cash but at the same time it's still almost heroic to me to say this is it's the right thing to do and so yeah. it's what i'm doing yeah I, I i like to think that there are still some heroes even the ones who code you know that's that's a, that's just pretty awesome and he's i mean he is a game maker so I, it's not like he's gonna uh, just uh, yeah, he'll, there'll be other obscurity. games, yeah, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, yeah. he'll, yeah. he'll have uh, something better to come along. And frankly, if how long was the game active? Was it a week? Oh no, no, it was active for at least a month. Okay, Maybe so more. it's been a month. Okay, well, so he's probably made the money that he needs to make to you know feed his family or or at least his uh, his soda habit or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. But, um, well, I mean, I'm 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 surprised that it took about. 12 hours for people to start coding Flappy Bird uh, knockoffs. Oh, yeah. And there are about 40 of them now, but none oh, yeah. of them have the same yeah. cheesy 8-bit goodness. <laughs> That's true. I think that may have been part of it, you know, is that, it, is that there was some sort of nostalgia that, that the millennials and, and us uh, pre-millennials, I guess... Just kind of access. There's something about that's that's that visceral eight bit experience of Super Mario Brothers that I think would I would find very very uh, becoming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, if well, I you can't because it. it's gone. It's gone yeah. forever. I did see on on um, on Facebook a couple of days ago one of uh, one of the people that that I follow. He said, "So I have an iPhone with Flappy Birds on it." A million dollars, and the phone is yours. <laughs> ah, well, you know they're selling on eBay for I mean five thousand dollars. Really. Oh, yeah, man. I think I think Dung is right. It has become a problem. <laughs> if, yeah, if if somebody is going to buy an iPhone for five thousand just so that they can play Flappy Birds, yeah, I yikes. Wow. Yeah, I know, and that's reels. That's for reels. Yeah, it, Flappy, it, Flappy Birds Anonymous uh, time. Yeah, there's <laughs> coffee in the back. So it it is uh, very very respectful and admirable what uh, what he did. By taking it down. And apparently uh, from Taylor in the chat room, who is newly confirmed, by the way, congratulations to her yay, and to yay. all of my other parishioners who received the Sacrament of Confirmation. Uh, Taylor says, Fallout Boy is making a knockoff Flappy Bird game called Fallout Bird. I I guess it's going to be the Flappy Bird, but with like a, a bowl cut with sharp, <laughs> pointed <laughs> bangs. Oh. That's my guess. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so um, I... I I've got to I've got to think that um, that I'm kind of glad that I'm not really kind of a gamer. Yeah. Because yeah. there's plenty of games that I haven't played. I, in fact, I don't have any I don't have any games on my phone. I don't. I have none. Yeah. Zero. Zero. I just deleted Wheel of Fortune. Oh yeah. I had Uno on my phone. Jeff, do you play games on your phone? I do. Uh, not very often. I have a. I really just have a couple. Uh, mm -hmm. One is the. Uh, 
Uh, the, is that gopher game where you spell words? Uh, uh, I'm not. Oh, into spell it. gopher. No, I don't know. What oh, it's what called. is that? Uh, 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 word womp. Word womp. That's the one. Womp yeah. womp. Yeah. <laughs> word. It's a game. That's right. It's a. That's word womp. Yeah, father. <laughs> father, on your non iPhone, you have games. Yeah, I have a couple. Um, nothing that I really spend a lot of energy on, but just, just like words killers. with friends and things oh, like yeah. that. Uh, my iPad, which I use almost exclusively when I'm home, has uh, crosswords and flappy birds, and uh, I'll sell it for five thousand dollars. <laughs> is interested, but uh, but no, I, I have a, just a couple of time killer games. Mm-hmm. Um, but since I've been here at Immaculate, I haven't had a lot of need to kill time, so I haven't played them much. Yeah, my time killer is Pinterest. Ah, Pinterest. Yeah. yeah. I could just Shoot. scroll forever in the geek category or I'm 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 kind of I'm gonna get made fun of, but I also <laughs> like the home decor category. I'm yeah. sorry. It's that's true. so sweet. There we go again. Yeah. You know, in in a in a slightly unrelated thing, because I know we're about to go to interstitial anyway. Yep. The my, one of my favorite magazines of all time is Southern Living. Yeah. I, I've mm-hmm. recommended it before. It's a great catalog. There is a new catalog called Gun and Garden. <laughs> wow. Gun and, and go- does the gun go in the garden? Or, it, it's either gun or garden, or maybe garden and gun. I don't remember. There's it's garden and gun. Um, garden and gun. It is the coolest magazine because it's everything from Southern Living plus bourbon plus firearms minus <laughs> home decor. <laughs> Love it. That is. It awesome. doesn't have home decor. I I can't I can't yeah, abide it's that. It's Garden and Gun Mag on Twitter if you're interested. But it's it's so much fun. Hey, Father, maybe great... maybe you and I should start Rectory Living Magazine. I don't know if we could pull that off. We've we've had a billion good ideas, but we still haven't accomplished any of them. Well, that's so. true. This would be Who the knows? closest one. Yeah, and we haven't pulled it off. You the... did build a chapel in your. I well, I did build a chapel in in my rectory. It's beautiful. It is nice. Yeah. It's it's almost finished. There's just a few little things here and there. But that's why I look at the home decor, because then you figure out, you know, oh, that's how you cover up that large uh, hulking piece of equipment that houses your phone system. I don't know. Yeah. All right. (laughs) Thou art listening to the Catholic Underground. We are online at catholicunderground.tv. Where you can find our live show feed, you can find our chat, and you can also find out more about the Catholic Underground. I am Father Chris Decker, joined by Father Ryan Humphreys on Skype, Jeff Blackwell in the technical director suite, Kathleen Lee to my left, and Mary-Kate Taylor in the video cave. Our picks of the week are coming up a little bit later. But first, uh, from the parenting in the new Millennium Desk, there are two stories this week. First, um, Lifehacker recommends that parents reward kids with screen time tokens. Yes, we all know that if parents don't force their kids to put down the electronic device... Like we were talking about. Yes, then they soon could become extras in The Walking Dead or any other zombie movie. That's true. Um, So (laughs) it's a must to limit screen time nowadays. At the same time, we know that good parenting means negative reinforcement for bad behavior... Mm-hmm. And positive reinforcement for good behavior. That's how we came up so well adjusted, Kathleen. That we, is true. We received all I of that. I thank my parents every mm-hmm. day for that. But what does positive reinforcement look like now? I can't even imagine mm-hmm. personally because I, I, having a child, I wouldn't want to know how to how to have to do that today. Yeah, because I, I see how it kind of manifests itself just in, like in church. Yeah. Well, Instructables user Little Mom on the Prairie, say goodnight, John Boy. Look her up. <laughs> has made little coins in 15, 30, and 60 minute denominations. Oh. Um, so huh? when the kid does good, he gets 15 minutes. When he does real good, he gets more. And he cashes them in for screen time. So it's like uh, kid Bitcoin. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I like that. I don't know. I don't. Well, okay. <laughs> Kathleen, you are of the. The question is. Well, how do you how do you say it? Yeah or meh? Yeah or meh? Yeah. So I don't know. I don't like this. I don't like. Um, I when I there's an old lady inside of me. I think, and when I saw the Kindle Fire commercial and it had that limit. Oh yeah. And then like the yeah. kid just goes, oh, puts it down and goes outside. Like my heart was just, what? Mm-hmm. That is awesome. Like <laughs> that was awesome. And I, 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 you know, and I've seen way too many. You know, being in, I did, I was in childcare for a little while in college and 
you know, being a babysitter and being around kids all the time, I've seen way too many people just shove a screen in front of their kid. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it'd be like, so I don't know, like, I don't, I, I don't even know if I'm on board with the, like, with the whole it, thing. I think it's a good idea for limiting. Yeah. You know, and I think it's a creative way nowadays. And I think, you know, there's some part of me that when I become a mom that, you know, that I will latch on to this, hopefully. Yeah. But um, there's some part of me that just is holding out that, like, ugh. Well, Kathleen, do you think that it's realistic to, because um, I know perhaps there are some parents who try to do this, to just keep electronic devices away from your children mm-hmm. until a certain age? I think that, um, I, I think it's doable. Yeah. Um, is it wise, though? Is there a wisdom to that? I think that there might be. Yeah. Because then it, it you know, but you have to, you have to fill that with something. Right. Books so I, and yeah. adventures or and making things. Or quality time and, hanging out with your parents. Yeah. You know, like, you know, gone are the days when my, my parents used to push us out the door and go, go play. Mm-hmm. And we would spend hours. I mean, I remember they cut down a tree by our house one day and me and my neighbor, Emily, made um, lasagna out of all the different kinds of like shavings and like cut pieces of wood and it was crazy they then ate the tree lasagna (laughs) (laughs) but i mean it took us four hours and it was awesome and that's a memory that i have forever you know i can't tell you what i watched on netflix last week as an adult yeah you know um so i you know as long as it's filled with other things it has to be filled with quality things i love watching my friends who are um who are homeschool moms yeah and just the stuff that they come up with um, the creative stuff that they that they do with their kids on a daily basis is incredible, and the majority of it has nothing to do with electronic devices. Jeff, you're the other parent here now. Mm-hmm. Now your kids are are grown and 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 out, and and so they didn't know being uh being tethered to a cord. Uh, well, and in fact, we were uh, I, I guess that that generation where the video games had just started coming out. Mm-hmm. We had. Um, not the Amiga, uh, and I can't the Atari remember, uh, or the Commodore. Uh, it was after the Atari, and because um, we had the Atari, yeah. Um, was, was it, it a the, Nintendo? The original Nintendo. Yeah. Was it Sega. Sega. Uh, it was Nintendo. <laughs> Nintendo. Okay. So uh, anyway, we had that, but we did have to limit our kids on how much they played. But we we had a pretty simple rule, uh, like we, you know, you get three responsibilities. You take care of your responsibilities. You earn privileges. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And those yeah. responsibilities are uh, every every. You know, one of our ch- kids had an assigned chore to take care of every day. They had to do their homework and keep the room clean. And it was pretty basic and simple. And uh, and if they didn't do one of those things, then, you know, they got like demerits. And um, and we even had times where it's like, okay, we are going to uh, say you have pizza one night, but um, you're going to have to eat. You know, pork and beans or something, but uh, I mean, it wasn't that bad. But uh, uh, but uh, those demerits uh, are pretty serious. But it's still along the same lines as that. You know, sure. into this, you 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 earn the privilege to to play that game if you uh, if you behave. So, do you like the idea of the uh, of the kid coins? I, I think so. I, I kind of do. Um, uh, uh, there there was a, a post on this um, this article uh, where one mom had, uh, had a poster made up where she changes her Wi-Fi password every day. And it's basically, you know, she had these, these rules, you, oh, you yeah. do this, this, and this, then I'll give you the, the, the password of the Wi-Fi so you can play for a while. So. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I think that's how, uh, how some people I know got rid of some, some, uh, tenants in their, in their house. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they wanted them to move out. <laughs> and really? go get a job and so so they that said would, well change the wi-fi uh, password that would be the absolute reason for me to learn how to hack wi-fi yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> get my get my wi-fi time no problem what is wpa2 and how do i hack it <laughs> that's right so you use your screen time to do this research <laughs> oh i would i would use every heartbeat of that screen time to do that research until there was no more of that chore nonsense i like that I'd change mom's password for her <laughs> and then lock her out of the system. Oh, my. He's, that's right. Um, uh, Mary Kate says it's a good thing you're a priest and morally upstanding. Yeah, yeah it, it, that's a good thing. <laughs> He's still not beneath him, I promise you. Well, you know, I, I've, I've explained how easy it is to do man-in-the-middle attacks to my kids at St. Mary's. And, uh, and so I have them all, you know, very, very, you know, very assured that if needs be, we'd write a little Python program and I could just capture all their Snapchat, you know, and then we'd, we'd just do it on, on, on morning prayer. We'll just put up some on the big screen and see what people think. 
So, so this is yeah. Father Ryan is using his 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 black hat skills. Mm. That is well, they all awesome. said uh, they all said, "What does hacking look like?" So I showed them some code, and they went, "Um, so you can really do this stuff? You're not just." I said, "Yeah." And they go, um, <laughs> okay. So, they, so immediately afraid. they said, "Do you have to use the Wi-Fi?" I said, "No, you can use your 4G." I said, "I won't do that. It's a felony." And I'll, immediately everybody pulls out their device and starts <laughs> tapping away. So now nobody's using the Wi-Fi. Oh, which is doesn't kind really of make a- any difference to me. It just you know it was fun. Yeah. Well. My goodness, I, I kind of like this coin idea. Mm-hmm. The, of course, to, to me, this is this is assuming that that you're policing what your kids are using their screen time mm-hmm. for, right? Because yeah. um, I mean, I know as as a kid, I was I was always on the computer, but it wasn't to play games. It was I was always in Corel Draw or um, Microsoft Paint or, or a creative type of program, and my parents were actually quite happy to have me using the computer for that, you know. Um, and of course that was the days of dial up internet. I think we remember those. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Um, but yeah, I would, I'm glad my parents knew. Yeah. It's because you're using creative programs. You're, you're making things for school or you're, uh, you're drawing and and that's a good thing. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, just 60 minute coins to, to play flappy birds. I don't know. Yeah. I think it has to be quality time on the internet. Yeah. I was thinking about this this weekend. Um, I don't know why, but just thinking about parents in general and, and, and internet usage and why some parents feel, and, and I'm not a parent, but I have heard this before, um, you know, some parents feel that they have no right to, like, to... to the bitch should be free. Yeah, like, like, oh. like that they're, that they have no right to... Oh. Restrict know, their kids' access. Yeah. Well, well, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I to assault know. is the best word that comes to mind. Their kids' privacy. Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, kids oh, don't deserve privacy. Of privacy. You know what I mean? Yeah, to invade their privacy, yeah. and I'm like, uh, uh, who pays for it? First <laughs> right. off, yeah. you know, and and like, you know, my parents would always. My mom was always a genius. She always found a way just to be like, <laughs> come up from behind. Yeah. Hey, what you doing? <laughs> Who are you talking Parents to? Parents are good at that. You know, yeah. and I would always be like, ah, and she, you know, and every once in a while, now not every time. But every once in a while, she would ask, "Oh, and who is mm-hmm. you know your mom Cheetos is good at 55, that. You know, yeah. and I'd be like, "Oh, well, that's so and so." At you know, and if I struggled, she'd be like, "Hmm, mm-hmm. your you know? mom." I know her mom. Yeah, and and her mom has the ability to ask the circumspective question. Yeah. So it's just kind of it'll come around the back, and before you know it, you've you've confessed. <laughs> you've completely you're like, confessed everything. We also, you know, but I, I also grew up in a house where we had five channels until I was in. Yeah. In high school. Yeah. You know, we, we were the last people to get cable. And then when cable came around, I was like, ah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like we were the last people to get to get, you know, non dial up. Yeah. Inter- internet. Inner things. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it was a task like to get online. It was like <laughs> Mike in the chat room later. says that the game has changed completely yeah. with uh, with things like digital time. And one of the things that that I think is a little bit of hope for me is uh, is that young families are rediscovering the the joy of of uh, of manually accessing their children you know <laughs> about about not having all this digital stuff of having a picnic going to the sandbox playing uh, and we don't don't mean like a, a place where you know you test websites you no know, an actual sandbox yeah. with sand and it has to be hypoallergenic sand now I think but uh, <laughs> Uh, but slides and all these things that are that are outdoor activities, it's interesting to see young families saying, you know, we we know that that virtual world is not going to help our children interact. Mm-hmm. But it's it's whenever parents um, sometimes seemingly for their own sanity just kind of abdicate all their authority to this digital device, and and that's I think where the challenge is 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 not for the kid who legitimately sees the flashy thing on the screen and wants to to play with it. But but the parent who doesn't abdicate their responsibility to teach their children um, this is this is what freedom is these are what limits are this is what boundaries are and uh, and I'm your parent um, if if you can't learn that that authority at this age then those are the things that that authority issues and well eventually anarchy I guess are made of where you just mm-hmm. don't think you have to answer to anybody mm-hmm. and so it is all these things are kind of uh, packed on top of each other. Tommy in the chat room says, my kids can have privacy when they move out of my house. And I think that's, <laughs> <Bingo>. <laughs> that's probably, a, I mean, yeah, but, Tommy. yeah, I didn't, I didn't have any privacy until I think I, I, I began to move into my teenage years 
And then slowly, 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 your parents kind of give you a little bit more and more, uh, you know, time where you're not completely transparent to them. Yeah. But yeah, I think that there's there's an important part of parenting there too, where yeah, privacy is is one of those things where no, it, it doesn't exist because your parents have a right to know what you're doing. They have a, a right to know, especially whenever you're you're not doing what's right, and to try and guide you in the right direction. It's not a thing uh, about you know just being up in your business. But I guess the online thing um, is what makes it all the more dangerous, too, yeah. uh, wouldn't you say? Oh, oh yeah. 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 Uh, let's see here. Uh, Taylor says, I'm used to it. I don't talk about anything inappropriate. So whenever they want to read my messages, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Again, this is Father Chris's golden rule of online posting. Yeah. Would I want my mom or my bishop to read it? Mm. That's, yeah. that's, that's my golden rule of online posting posting yeah. uh, anything i think too like there's there's that you know we're talking about the danger of being online and and like chatting and stuff like i've been in situations as an adult where i've been like oh, okay <laughs> like <laughs> shutting this down yeah but i can't imagine mm. you know we're talking about the kids out there just oh hey what's going on we we talk and like no thank you as a parent i'd be terrified like mm-hmm. i would never let my child on a computer ever you know <laughs> but yeah but that's what's what but it is, it is what it is. Uh, let us know what you think. Back chat at catholicunderground.com. You are listening to the Catholic Underground. I am Father Chris Decker, joined via Skype by Father Ryan Humphreys. Kathleen Lee sits to my left. Jeff Blackwell sits before me. And Mary Kate Taylor switches the video in some ivory tower miles away actually it's right in the other room uh, yeah but uh, we've been talking about parenting and in that same vein the folks at modern parents have penned an internet contract between parents and kids so this may be the the next development jeff oh of, i know uh, of, of what we've been talking about actually and i can see toddlers right now uh, hiring an attorney <laughs> toddler uh, attorney <laughs> toddler attorney father i think <laughs> reality tv <laughs> I want three more juices before noon. Well, I think I really think <laughs> all I see are number signs, dollar signs everywhere, dollar signs. <laughs> kid coins everywhere. Sorry. <laughs> Continue, Jeff. Oh, I, I will if I, I can uh, remember where I was. You can muster, that. yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, uh, uh, this this idea I, I think in theory, uh, it, you know, starts off pretty good, but enforcing it's going to be quite another thing. But uh, someone has come up with um, uh, it, well, it was the folks at. Um, Golly, what is it? Uh, Modern, Modern parents. parents. Thank mm-hmm. you. Um, a contract uh, that spells out limits and the rules for using the device on the uh, on the web, and that way, when the rule is violated, the punishment is already agreed upon. So it's oh. just, it, it literally is a contract, and uh, I would urge our listeners and viewers to to uh, check this out. Um, we'll put it in the show notes at catholicunderground.com. Good. Uh, anyway, um, it, 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 it really is a big deal, um, in dealing with, uh, pornography, uh, but it's also, a, a, a great, um, idea for, um, uh, keeping track of, uh, the times of, of playing games and what have you. And, um, uh, I, I think in theory, like I say, it, it, it it's great, but enforcing it's going to be tough for a parent to do because you still have to keep an eye on what your kids are doing and, and what yeah. their, uh, their surfing habits are. Yeah, and that's that's always the, the the hard thing is to try and keep uh, track of all that. But uh, but there are there are things out there, Father Ryan, uh, that that help parents to keep their eyeballs on what their kids are doing, right? Oh yeah, there's mountains of good software. Um, there there's all kinds of. I mean, you have to think too of if you really want to be like a nerd parent who wants to go above and beyond, you can just turn on screen sharing and then yeah. lock that feature. I mean, you, there's all kinds of ways. Uh, to enforce it in a in a, a way when you're tangibly there and then in a way when you're not. Um, and I think the internet contract is actually a really good thing to teach responsibility, yeah. provided that you have a kid who takes responsibility seriously. And ultimately, that's kind of one of those foundational parenting skills. You know, you have to instill in your kids the idea that their personal responsibility matters. And of course, some kids are hard to get at into than yeah. others. Um you know, with this particular question, I think, uh, like a Jeff, I think it's a good thing, but I think there are drawbacks, especially when it comes down to, um, you know, what if the kid does something that's in the contract, but does it in such a bad way that the punishment needs to excel, yeah. but you've already agreed to what's in the contract. 
On the other hand, though, and I think, Father, this, you'll agree this is a big deal, this gives a parent an easy way to sit down and explain to a child what is okay yeah. and what is not. And that's a difficult conversation to start, and this contract may very well be a good way to start that conversation. Yeah, it seems to me like this could be that that important buffer between the two um, to, to be able to say, look, uh, son, daughter, <laughs> child, uh, <laughs> listen, child. Look nice. to me, child. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Don't make eye contact. No. Uh, so to be able to say, look, there are some bad things out there. And uh, and as you get older or maybe if they're a teen already, you know, and, and I know that this could be very well a temptation. And so here are some things, and maybe you can come up with some things that that you know to be bad, and uh, and let's let's look at it. And and I think that level of authenticity is something that maybe we we're afraid of with our kids, mm-hmm. but I think that it's very clear that um, that our young people need that authenticity because I, I've been told, Kathleen, mm-hmm. uh, that young people. Um, are itching for boundaries to be laid out for them. Yes. I have discovered in teaching that um, they like rules, even yeah. though they won't say it out loud. Mm-hmm. Right. They really like when I'm like, when I tell them, you know, um, you're out of uniform, you get a checklist. Wait, what? Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> They're like, I gotcha. You know, like. <laughs> they get all check off on it. I can yeah. do that. I can yeah. do that. Yeah. <laughs> right. I tell them every time when they come to class, if you follow the rules, you'll be okay. If not, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then there will be consequences. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mike says in the chat room, I think if parents uh, communicate with their children, uh, well, kids will have a better understanding of the gravity of their actions. And, and there's a lot of truth to that. If, if there's a level of transparency, then, yeah, kids are going to understand. Will your parents, will you lose some cool cards? Will your street cred go down with your kids? Probably. But I think to, to most parents nowadays, uh, are you, well, I can't say that this is unilateral, but... A lot of parents that are really good don't worry about their street cred, right, Father? No, the, you really, it's true. I mean, at a certain point, you've got to simply, you know, take the risk. It's the same way the thing with the Christian faith. You have to take the risk and say, this is as it is. And if you do it in such a way that you, it's coming from a place of love, that it's evident that it's coming from a place of love, but that this is, some, and this is something that's good for you, whether you like it or not, yeah. um, then it tends to go well. I mean, it's, it's the same thing with me and my kids at St. Mary's. You know, I have to, from time to time, call them out. Uh, one of the things I had to call them out on is wearing leggings like they're actually clothes uh, and not underwear. Oh, yeah. The and, 80s. Uh, you know, oh. and, and, you know, they were some, and I said, girls, you're not going to like this, but it's the way it is. And some people were fairly upset, but it was clear that it came from a place of love. It came from a place of protecting them. And so, you know, I had a lot of people say, I really appreciated the way you said that because it could have been could have been mean, but you said it in a way that really made us feel like you cared. And, and I think that's the big thing to communicate with kids. Yeah. Uh, because I think one of the, the reasons that kids like um, those boundaries is because whenever you express a boundary to a child, you're expressing a desire to, to be in communication with them, to be in relationship with them. And uh, I think the Book of Wisdom, if not the Book of Proverbs, talks a lot about that, right? If you, if you set a rule before a child and show him the way that he will go, he should go, then he won't deviate. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's, that's part of it. And then to realize that there are consequences for actions. And, you know, I, I wonder if maybe we can make a connection between um, lack of parenting and maybe even lack of doing this contract thing. And then whenever a child grows up, they don't have a concept of sin and of the need for confession and penance. Would you say that's a, that's a case? Well, I, I'm not a parent and I'm not planning on being one, but, uh, but I think it is very true. I think that, you know, the decisions you make at, at the youngest age on the smallest things translate into the most important, you know, kind of, of philosophical life choices that yeah. the kids are going to, are going to care about later on. And, and I agree hundred percent, you know, you, 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 you show them that this matters when they're young and they get out of high school, they get out of college and they realize these are the things that matter in life. And these are things that matter in raising their own kids. Yep. Yep. Uh, Taylor, who is a new confirmat, says, I need to know my restrictions. It makes me more comfortable and I can't make excuses. So I hold myself accountable for my own actions. And, and that's, that's very well said. Uh, Lauren says, rules can give kids the excuse to do the right thing. And uh, Bobby says, I'm not interested in being my daughter's buddy. I'm her mom, not her playground friend. I love that we get along and enjoy each other's company, but ultimately I'm her mom first. I love that. Too many mom, like especially, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna call out the moms a little bit. <laughs> Too many moms want to be 
their kids friends yeah i am grateful that my mom did not ha- want to be my friend at all um at all and mm-hmm. she made that very clear and i you know now as an adult <laughs> and i don't have kids but now as an adult you know seeing the way that some people in my life have have grown up and gone about in the world i probably on a weekly basis tell my parents out loud mm-hmm Thank you. I just thank And then you. what happens too now that you're adults, I'll be I'd be willing to bet cuz I know this is the case with my parents cuz I was I was house trained as well, you know. Mm. Um <laughs> they they trained me well in the way that I should go and and I give them thanks for that, but I'm more their friend now. Yes, yes. Because because there was an authenticity to their relationship between parent and child. Right. And now um Generally speaking, there there is an adult relationship that can happen, yeah. yeah, and that's where friendship can begin to come in and to blossom. And that's it's almost as if that's that's the engineered way that God has in store for us, yeah. so that we can then spend the rest of their lives with them, and uh, we can then learn how to to parent. And I mean, it's the same in a parish, really, too. Um, you, you're having to to help people to understand. Uh, from a spiritual father standpoint, the way that we ought to go in terms of, um, of moving from spiritual childhood through spiritual adolescence into spiritual adulthood, uh, Paul talks a lot about that in his uh, in his epistles uh, as well. So good stuff, um, Jeff. You you finish up by saying uh, good luck enforcing the contract, huh? Yeah, and um, I think everybody, uh, you know, we can we can all join in. The, the reason why uh, it's going to be hard to enforce is because kids. Will, will be kids. They will. Mm-hmm. That's true. And that, like little velociraptors, they are always attacking the fences, looking for weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. You like that? Yeah, I did. I like it. You're listening to the Catholic Underground. I'm Father Chris Decker. <laughs> You're going a different direction, weren't you? Kathleen Lee is um in stitches over there. Yeah, I am. Father Ryan Humphreys joins us via Skype, Jeff Blackwell, and uh, Mary Kate is here as well. You know, there are plenty of stories of saints who left all they had to lead a life uh, free from attachment to materialism, but now millennials are embracing this anti-materialism without any reference to the faith. And Father, are you surprised? Yes, I am, actually. It's it's being called minimalism. And oh. unlike your hipster nonsense where you put on, you know, <laughs> silly kind of, you know, horn-rimmed glasses. stuff. Yeah. Um, it's not really a function of poverty, and it's not really a function of something ironic. It's a function of just sheer exhaustion yeah. with having to chase around some ideal of whatever. And so you have really, really wealthy people, like we're going to share in, in the show notes, uh, a guy who had 600 k a year uh, dumping it to live in an apartment that was about the size of our seminary rooms or about the size of a dorm That's room. That's 10 by 12. Um, <laughs> And then you you have people you know who are who are less wealthy who just want to get rid of the clutter and who want to get into something more simple and you know it might be that it's a function of our digital life making things like books and CDs and you know cheap art you know junky wall, wall art obsolete yeah, those sad but, clowns yeah <laughs> so many sad but I think clown most pictures. of the people who are embracing uh, minimalism argue that it's about the peace and the freedom that comes with it and you know what stands out to me is it's one of those things about faith where it has side effects. You know, mm-hmm. Christianity has side effects. A prayer has the side effect of giving you a sense of calm and peace. And detachment from things has the side effect of giving you that sense of comfort and joy. And, you know, it seems like they've stumbled onto the side effect yeah. without actually stumbling onto the thing that really matters. And, you know, at some level, I believe God could use you go the other way around. God is certainly big enough to operate in the other direction. Sure. And so, who knows? I mean, either way, it's a good thing to to set aside materialism, um, even if it's not done for particularly good reason. Yeah, I, I think that that I would be willing to say the same thing. I mean, um, uh, honestly, you know, you would like to think that that monks go into a monastery because they have this all figured out already. <laughs> but uh, but from the monks that that you and I know. Um, some enter maybe with a, an ideal of, um, of of what the monastery life is, but they come about entering the monastery because of the side effects, and then they discover the God who brought them to the monastery. You know, and and sometimes per- perhaps that's the way with married life and things of that nature too. You you go in for the side effects that you think are the actual effects of marriage, 
but then the Lord is able to work and show you and unfold things. So I think that there could be some truth to that. Um, so I guess, would you say that that uh, that it has the same benefits, regardless of the intention? Just, just Well, I think it has some of the same benefits. You know, as you say, I mean, there's certainly going to be a sense of peace. There's going to be a sense of of less distraction, but that numbness yeah. that is so common among millennials is not going to change because that's only going to change from an encounter with Christ. Correct. Um, yeah. And and I think that a lot of the other things that that give rise to the desire for the peace and quiet, etc., mm-hmm. are still going to be, you know, holes in the heart. But at the same time, like you say, this is a great place to start. And so I think it's going to have benefits to be sure. I just don't think they're going to be the same as if someone really sought to know, love, and serve God. Yeah, and that perhaps is is the way that you you kind of come about. It's all the point of departure. Those who who want to serve God then discover in the service of God a desire to simplify. But but I think that that there could be something to this in that yeah, every there, there's just too much. There's too much stuff. There's too much. So I'm going to simplify for the sake of simplification. And uh, you know that that does kind of open a hole um, for for the Lord to work. In fact, um, in the chat room, uh, BT says, I see a Buddhist tie-in here. And there does seem to be something of Zen Buddhism in this minimalist movement, huh? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like Zen Buddhism without the actual moral practice. Yeah. You know, just, just taking some picking and choosing. It's, it's cafeteria Buddhism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's right. <laughs> Which, there is no cafeteria. <laughs> there is no food. Yeah. I don't know, Kathleen, um, what do you think of this millennial minimalist movement? <laughs> wow. Um, I'm not a part of it, for sure. No. I, I have too, way too much stuff. Um, and a French bulldog. And a French bulldog, which carries his own stuff, including, you know, Yoda. The French, the French bulldog has, like, his own tote system. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, He's got Yoda ears and a bat suit and, you know. Yeah. Things to come with it. No, I I am am not part of this <laughs> part of this this idea. Um I routinely have too much stuff coming out. Like my four seater right now, my four seater uh, SUV is now a two seater. Oh yeah. Um because there's stuff in the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, my, one of my uh, my pastors growing up called the passenger seat of the car his celibacy seat. He says, my wife doesn't sit here <laughs> because I don't have a wife, but my, you know, my um, ritual books sit here, my oil stock sits here, my, my stole sits here. Yeah, it's mm. true. You yeah. can amass a lot of stuff. It's kind of like having a treadmill in your room. A treadmill can yeah. hold more than an earth closet. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. That is true. Now, there is a desire. I think it, there's a desire in everyone's life at some point, you know, where it gets to be, you know, I'm like, Gosh, dog it! I do not need to be going down the dollar aisle at Target anymore because I just get stuff that I don't need, um, you know. And it gets to be overwhelming, and you mm-hmm. know, it's it's like I can't even think right because there's too much stuff, you know, yeah. in my face. And so there is merit to to this movement I for sure. So. I think so. Um, but it's it's all in in uh, how it comes about, and really, if people recognize uh, that that gaping hole there that uh, should have been filled by simplifying, well, what do you fill it with? If you're not filling it with the Lord, you can't fill it with pudding. That's all we're going to say. I mean, oh, you, can tr- <laughs> you can try. Sorry. Did you know that I was born on National Chocolate Pudding Day? It explains a lot now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kathleen. It does. Hmm. So, uh, very quickly here. Are digital magazines even a thing anymore? I, uh, okay, here's the deal. Um... There, there is a new digital magazine that's out. It's called The Intercept. And uh, from what I can tell, in the short term, it's, letting a, um, it's providing a mouthpiece for Edward Snowden, you know, the big leaker guy, uh, to have a mouthpiece, to have a, a, an online form. Uh, and in the long term, it, it sounds like they want to bring in people to do magazines. But Father Ryan, this, this sounds like a blog to me. Yeah, I mean, it I looks like a blog. Now, yeah. what... There is a phenomenon among the Tumblr community of having these highly specific blogs. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, Tumblr's, Tumblr's are all ugly. This is yeah. a really beautiful. It's very nice. Uh, it's gorgeous. Well designed. And, and I think the big difference is feature length articles. Yeah. When you combine beautiful design, feature length articles, and a high degree of specificity, 
Right. You effectively have a blog, but it is a digital magazine that I would actually read. Yeah. Um, ironically, Guns and Garden, Gun and Garden is, uh, or Garden and Gun, is like that. It's a beautiful website. It's a physical print magazine, but you know, it's it's specific feature length mm-hmm. and it's focused. And I like that idea too. I mean, sometimes blogging can get rather banal, uh, but uh, <laughs> we're just all over the alliterations tonight. <laughs> Uh, but I like long form uh, things like this show is is a long form program. Uh, I like reading long form blogs that have little breaks in the middle that you can go and get some coffee and come back to. So I guess I guess we're we're calling it a magazine. It's uh, kind of a long form blog, but I like the idea of it. I just I I wonder if it'll catch on as a magazine. If they're not going to ever do a physical product, I mean, it's just going to have to be. They're, they can think of it as a magazine, but the rest of the world's going to think of it as a blog. Yeah. I mean, Regina Magazine, um, Bobby shows us in the chat room, is another example. Um, Ignitum Today is kind of the same way, right? It's, right. it's a long form uh, blogish thing. Uh, but I, I wonder if maybe as iPads and, uh, and other forms of media uh, such as that or other forms of hardware such as that come about, we're not going to see more uh, apps. Kind of like what um, what was Rupert Murdoch's venture called? Um, oh, the the, the daily. daily. Yeah, I wonder if we're not going to see more more things like that that are laid out in a web page, but that are using HTML five and things of that nature to uh, to give you more of a magazine experience. It's hard to say. I mean, it, you got to wonder whether that's really going to be valuable for enough people to make it worth doing. Yeah, um, and and worth and being able to fund itself. I think that's the big question. Yeah. And, and how do you make that work? I mean, we're, we're Catholics, so uh, we pretty much do everything for free. You know? Yay! Yeah. Um, Catholic Underground, for free, which is why we count on you. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm interested to see where this goes. I'd like to see it kind of grow and, and uh, develop a little bit more and uh, see if it can break out of the blog. Yeah. That I think the design feature of the blog, the last in, last out thing, is we're probably done with that. I, I'd love to see that go the way of the dodo. Because yeah. it's ugly. <laughs> For those of you just joining us, the dodo still extinct. Right. All right. Um, <laughs> it is. I, I'm, I'm not speaking out of school, Jeff Blackwell. But, you know, I am speaking about what we like to call the CU Pick of the Week. All righty. For our CU Pick of the Week, Jeff, why don't we go to you since you're so uh, happy there in the, in the technical director suite? Well, and thank you for allowing me to, to occupy... Space. <laughs> uh, it's not all up to me. <laughs> uh, I came across uh, because I uh, uh, these winter months uh, and the crystal clear skies at night. I, I just always love being able to stand out there and gaze at the the planets and stars. Um, yeah, the for, celestial scenes have oh, been surprisingly serene. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. And um, when I, it just depends on how cold it is, first of all. But um, I was looking for something on um, on the internet as to um, I was trying to figure out if it was Venus or a different you know planet because I right now believe during the month of February there are five planets that are visible. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of which um, I, I brought up my telescope for uh, Saturn was just remarkable. I could see the the rings of Saturn, uh, Ooh. And, and I don't really have a, oh. a real expensive telescope. So um, anyway, it's I actually a Pringles can. Oh. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, never mind. <laughs> you guys are on food, and I'm talking. Never, never mind. <laughs> Just messing with you. Uh, but uh, I came across a uh, a link to EarthSky.org, and it's uh, it's a wonderful site for. Uh, they have tabs at the top, like you can look for tonight's uh, oh. tab, for example, and it'll show you uh, what to look for in the sky tonight. But uh, there's also things of uh, geology, nature. Um, uh, sciences uh, really around the globe. So um, uh, they they have uh, some really neat videos, some beautiful photography. Uh, not only you know just stuff from the Hubble, uh, but um, stuff here on the ground too. Looking up, so wow. it's uh, it's a neat site and uh, seems to be pretty family friendly. Uh, I haven't seen anything that I really objected to uh, on it. So uh, so so it it's out. it's kind of like your own private Jack Horseheimer. I you, wish I could do the imitation of that guy, but uh, well, basically, you do James Dewan, but an astronomer standing on the rings of Saturn. Show and us. keep looking up. There you go. And then he ascends. <laughs> yeah. Right. Do you know who Jack Horsheimer is? I yeah. Um, yeah. I've seen him. 
Yeah, because you had one of the five channels. I did. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Father Ryan, you know who that is, right? Yes, I do. Yeah. Good. Good on you. All right. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, Jeff, I was making fun of your telescope. <laughs> Saying uh, it was a Pringles can. A Pringles can. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, it, it it's was, bigger. It, yeah, it was bigger. It's like about a two hundred dollar telescope. So it's oh, it's a, real, a big Pringles can. Yeah, Finger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kathleen, uh, you're Marine Pringles Marine. pick of the week. No, Pringles does not. Yeah, sorry. I picked a book um, <clears throat> called Miracles of John Paul the um, Second. Does anyone? I know him. I know who John Paul the Second is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have this book. Oh, awesome! Now, does anyone want to try the the name before I do? I will say his name is Powell. Yeah, Pavel. Pavel Zunowich. Yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah. Anyways, mm-hmm. um, any, it's a it's a one of those books that I bought uh, because I'm a book collector and I look at them mm-hmm. on my shelf. Um, and it's a book that I pulled out <laughs> um in in preparation for Blessed Pope John Paul II's canonization yes. in April. Mm-hmm. Booyah. So um, I it's it's a list of all um, things that are miracles that are attributed to him, and I, I have I just started flipping through it, um, but it is I didn't realize that that there were so many, and there will be many more, I bet. Yes, and yeah. I'm super excited. So it's pretty cool. It's, it's it's accounts from all kinds of different people, and some of these were during his lifetime, right? Mm-hmm, yeah, some of them, yeah, some of them, you know, people having, you know, especially. Um, young people having private audiences with him and then then being healed of of whatever it is yeah you know and then after his death they they um they like, reveal what he said and it was all simple words like jesus loves you and wants you to be healthy yeah you know and they were like that's it and now mm-hmm. i am <laughs> you know yeah it's pretty awesome it, it reminds me of the scriptures whenever uh jesus heals somebody and says don't say anything yeah you know mm-hmm. that absolutely that that this is a moment for you to reflect on in the silence of your heart and and then when the time comes, and of course, Father, we know how this goes, right? They immediately run and tell everybody, you know, everyone it, with ears, everyone with ears who could hear, mm. and then some who probably couldn't. Uh, and so, how neat it is to to see these coming forth, mm. and to realize that that John Paul II really was a, a holy man, and that that if you're doing it right, um, the Lord can wor- work through you in ways that you can't even begin to to even understand. I I, I know that um, uh, just as a priest. The thing, I can't say that I've ever been responsible for somebody's healing, at least not that I know of, you know. Um, but but when the Holy Spirit tells you to tell a person something, um, and, and that brings about really a, a, a spiritual healing or an emotional or psychological healing, uh, those are the things that you go, wow, that, oh, yeah. uh, totally was not me. And so how, how neat it is to, to be able to read about that. I like that idea. Um, Father Ryan, your pick of the week. week. I want to do two, but, I, but both of them are short. The first one is a thing called HemingwayApp.com. Mm-hmm. Hemingway App is a free website, uh, and you can cut and paste, or you can type directly into the website, and it will evaluate the grade level you're writing on. Oh. It will tell you which of your sentences are hard to read, which are very hard to read. It will tell you how many adverbs you ought to have for the length of your writing. Wow. It will tell you, uh, and it'll highlight all this stuff too, so it's really easy to edit your material. It'll tell you what words and phrases should be simplified, where you're using passive voice. And so it allows you really to take like something you're writing, whether it's a bulletin article or whether it's a paper for school, and really see in a very clear and easy to see kind of of system of this is what you need to do to make it better. Um, I have been blown away by how well it works. And of course, they say in there, you know, these are guides, not laws. And so you can break them if you know what you're doing, just like an artist can break the rules if he knows what he's doing. Um, And I've found it actually has improved my writing and I'm I'm really enjoying it. It's very, very free. um, And they are considering doing a desktop version of the app, which I told them I would pay money for right away. Yeah, that's Um, one of those that's one of those tabs you would keep open, Father. Yeah, it's 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 immediately made its way onto my uh my bookmark bar, my yeah. very very preciously spaced bookmark bar, and it's great. So HemingwayApp.com. And the other thing I want to tell people about is to look up Septuagesima. Yes. In the traditional calendar of the uh, the extraordinary form, as we call it, today begins the ramp toward Lent. Septuagesima. And so the the mass tonight, the traditional Latin mass had purple vestments. It yep. had no Alleluia. It had no Gloria. 
Lent has not started, but we're getting ready. The liturgy is going to set our hearts and minds ready. And so the idea of Septuagesima is a beautiful thing that sadly was uh, was simply tossed aside in the Reformation. And so I'm going to put the wiki article in the show notes, and I'm going to recommend everybody take a look at it. Septuagesima, the season of pre-Lent. Beautiful, beautiful thing. Don't don't miss it. Take a look I at love, it. I love being Catholic. I this is one of those things that I wish that that we had retained in the yeah. ordinary form because I I think that that we use Lent as the ramp up for Easter and so we pick we spend so much time doing that that we don't do adequate preparation for Lent. In fact, I got one of my first questions before mass today about giving something up for Lent or what should I do? And I was mm-hmm. thinking and in fact I told the person I said, "Thank you for asking that question now. Thank you for actually bringing that to prayer now." And how beautiful it is that in the in the grand history of of the Catholic Church, we got a liturgy for that. <laughs> you know, there, there's something <laughs> that, we? that uh, that that begins to to help our hearts prepare. And so, yeah, look look that up. Um, my pick of the week is uh, something that Spotify reminded me about, and it's one of my uh, my favorite artists that uh, that I I think I became acquainted with in in the seminary. Bebo Norman, I believe he's actually going back on tour. Um, but uh, his his self titled album from two thousand and eight, Bebo Norman, um, really good music. It's uh, he's got some some peppy pieces, but he's also uh, got some a very reflective style as well. And so uh, Bebo Mormon, uh, not Mormon, Bebo Norman, <laughs> I recommend. It's uh, it's been difficult for vowels and continents, con- con- consonants. Continents. <laughs> Which one? Oh, that what would be talking? the name of my emo band, Vowels and Continents, um, and Continents. All right. Uh, I, I don't know, Jeff. I think maybe we should just do the uh, the plug. <laughs> All right. Works for me. Portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. That's audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. All righty. And, you know, we thank you, as I said before, for everything that you do for us at Catholic Underground. We're here because of you, and we stay on the air, and we're here every week because you want us here, apparently. And, uh, and so we are. So keep praying for us, and if you can, uh, help us out financially. You can do that by going to catholicunderground.com slash donate and checking out all the options there. All right, if you would like the the show notes that accompany our podcast, if you want to learn more about our apostolate, you can always do that by going over to catholicunderground.com, and uh, there's there's plenty there. Uh, You can also find out whenever we're going to do a live show, so if you ever haven't ever uh, chimed in on the live show, we've got, what, 11 people, usually as many as 17 people in the chat uh, who are becoming regulars, and uh, and it really is a lot of fun. In fact, there's a whole other show going on in the chat room right now, so a big shout out to our our, our undergrounders who are chatting right now. Uh, if you want to find out ways to connect with us on Twitter or Facebook, you can head over to catholicunderground.com or facebook.com slash catholicunderground. And of course, um, we, we're we going to do the roll call here because yeah. we're, we're happy about that. Uh, we've got all these people, all these people. Father Ryan's church is online at minorbasilica.org. He's at FR Humphreys on Twitter. Thank you, Father Ryan. It has been my pleasure. Jeff Blackwell is the tech director for the CU. He's the uh, he's the head guy over at the Blackwell Communications Group. JeffBlackwell.us and at Jeff Blackwell us. Thank you, Jeff. It's a privilege, Father. Thank yes, you. indeed. You you live up to your name. You are Blackwell. I I don't know what that means. Uh, we've also got uh, <laughs> Kathleen. She's the Faith Ninja at Kathleen Y A B R. Thank you, Kathleen. Anytime. And Mary Kate Taylor is an evangelist, and in her spare time, she practices her spot-on impersonation of Dame Judy Dench. You know me, I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me at Digital Catholic. You can join us on the interwebs at catholicunderground.tv for even more from the CU. Have a good night. Catholic Underground.